Taking the Stage as Senior Program Officer, used her experience in innovation at Gates Foundation, Tracy Johnson. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us um, in this weather and, and the, the down slope of the lunch hour. Um, one of the things that Cheryl said when she, when she started us off this morning was that part of today is, is beginning a conversation about what is the value of social impact design. Um, and in, in that spirit, as, as this is part of a conversation, I, I, I'd like to share a story with you that demonstrates that perhaps I'm, bring, I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective than, than many of the, the folks who've talked thus far. So I, I enter this conversation from the social sciences. I'm trained as an anthropologist, and I've practiced throughout most of my career as a, as a social and cultural anthropologist. And I guess you could say I cut my teeth in the mountains of northern Thailand working with a hill tribe called the Hmong. And it's, it's a story about them that, that I would like to share with you to start out. The picture that you see on the right is actually what's called a spirit lock. And if we were in, um, and actually I'm, I'm wearing one as well, if we were in the mountains of northern Thailand right now, walking through a Hmong village, this would be a fairly common sight. We would see some of these amulets hanging from the necks of young children. They would adorn the very brightly embroidered clothing that every Hmong makes at, at New Year's for the, for the celebration. Um, but what is less common, but you see from time to time walking through the villages, is that there are some people who are wearing 10 to 20 of these spirit locks. And this is a very small one, and they're very big. And you begin to wonder, why is someone laden down in, in such a way? Um, and in the, in the particular village where I lived and conducted research, I uh, was privileged to conduct research for, for many years, um, there was a girl who was so adorned. Um, and in fact, she had cerebral palsy. The function of, of the spirit lock, the promise of it, can actually be gleaned from its name. So it serves to do exactly what it says it does. It serves to lock one's spirit into one's body. Now this is very critical because when one is ill, uh, even depressed, stressed, and certainly when one suffers from a condition such as cerebral palsy, all of these situations are believed to have been caused because your soul got up and walked away from your body. And what I wanna talk about is um, how the spirit lock becomes actually a symbol. Um, because that's really what it is. It's a, it's a symbol of protection. Or because I spend a lot of my life looking at the world through the eyes of my 12-year-old son, it's, you know, it's your superpower. The way that the spirit lock acts symbolically within a community is it calls everyone together to provide aid, protection, comfort, and care to those who need it. And the real beauty of the spirit lock is that it works. And I don't need, we don't need to engage in a, in a philosophical discussion about the um, metaphysical properties of, of the amulet I'm wearing around my neck as to whether or not there is this reality that it could actually lock your soul into your body. It works because it becomes a clarion call to the community. That the person wearing a spirit lock needs their protection, their aid, their comfort, and their care. So I, I want to start out this, I, I started with this story because this is just one of the ways that we all use symbols to organize and make meaning in our lives. Um, and to echo uh, something my, my friend um, Jonathan mentioned earlier is that it gets at, to me in many ways, it gets at the ethics um, or the ethical foundations that should really be at the heart of what we're talking about as um, design for social impact. So before we came here today, uh, Cheryl asked us to think about what is our definition of, of good design, particularly good social impact design. Um, and for me, it really is all about possibility. Um, so good design, uh, creates the possibility for designing new and innovative solutions 
that help us articulate new ways of being in the world. Um, now, to achieve this type of design, I think it's really important to embrace ambiguity. And what I mean by that is not only go into situations where we're going to use design, ready to answer the questions that we know, but to actually open ourselves up to the questions that we don't know yet. What is also uh, implied in this definition of, of, of social impact design for me is that it needs to really engage with social and cultural norm. In other words, I don't think that good design should simply respond to behavior, but that it needs to engage with and understand why we behave the way that we do um, and how that behavior shows us traces to the vision that people might have of where they would like to, to ultimately be. Um, I think the last thing I, I want to say about this, this particular definition is that it underscores for me um, that designs will not be fully adopted, or as you know, in the world of the Gates Foundation achieve uptake, um, if we don't have inherent in that design a flexibility. Um, so we don't keep a space open for people to, as they adopt and use those designs, to actually adapt them so that they can use them to do what I've been saying, articulate a new way of being in the world and make meanings, make new meaning for what that being in the world is. I wanted to, to sort of illuminate that a little bit more. I wanted to draw on um, some trends that, that people are talking about in sort of the, the design world more globally. And in this case, I'm, I, I'm going to draw on architecture. On the right is a newly designed staircase for an advertising firm that's actually located here in this city. Um, I see somebody nodding up there. Um, and I learned this recently. Uh, staircases have become the new critical design feature because they're increasingly becoming imagined less as sites for circulation and more as what would you say, zones for exchange. What's interesting to me about this particular focus on staircases as the point for the, the serendipitous social encounter is that it is in direct response to where we find ourselves as social beings. To be a social being today, and I think it goes without saying, you know, in the world of social media, means to live a very curated life. But what we often don't think about, or I think spend enough time thinking about, is that to get to that point of curation demands an intensely personal focus. So we're interested in what we already know. We talk to people on social media who we're already friends with. We read news that is chosen for us by established algorithms. And we spend our days spending, uh, spending a great deal of time looking at the screens of the devices that we carry with us. So the chance encounter, the serendipitous exposure to something new, gets increasingly relegated to the past. And the staircase becomes a moment in the day where we can break that looking at the screen. We can break that, break past the, the curation um, to capitalize on other possibilities. And this staircase is, is meant to do that. Now, the staircase on the left is, uh, is one of the uh, quote-unquote charming features of architecture in, a, in Montreal, which is a city that I used to call home. And for those of you have, who have spent time in Montreal in the winter know how frigidly cold and how treacherously icy it can be, particularly metal staircases. Um, and having myself uh, started out on the top of one of those staircases and within seconds landed very unceremoniously on my tuchus in the snow, <laughs> I have found myself asking the question, who ever thought to do this and why? And so what's interesting is that at the turn of the century, a very Catholic Montreal was faced with an influx of European immigrants 
who were increasingly looking for housing in these three-story, sometimes two, usually three-story, apartment buildings that were popping up all over the landscape of the city. And um, the leaders of the church were very concerned about what was going to happen in such spaces where men and women who were previously unknown to one another were go going to come into close contact. Um, and so their answer was to take the staircases. Staircases are very dangerous at night. Men and women passing in the dark might give in to temptation. Um, and they took this very personal space and they put it on the outside, making it very public. And the reason I, I, I throw these two examples up here is what I want to help people think about is how these designs were responsive to what it meant to be a social being in a particular time, what it meant for how we should live and act and behave in the world. Um, so a question that, that I, get, I get asked quite often, and even just a, several weeks ago had a, had a phone call with a colleague about this, is how can anthropology and design come together? Can they come together and how so? And the question is really predicated on the idea that anthropology documents the past and the present, while as design is about the potential of, of the future. And the thing that, that I would like to suggest we should think about, uh, you know, being trained as an anthropologist, what I spend a lot of my time thinking about the ways in which life is socially constructed. I mean, what this means is that through our everyday behaviors, um, we enact and we produce what it means to be a social be uh, being in a particular set of contexts. So our present emerges very specifically from the stories that we tell ourselves about our past. And that's our individual past as well as our social past. Um, but it is also critical because in telling these stories, we are setting the stage um, for that potential future that we hope to emerge. And so in these ways, the, three, the two disciplines and the, the past and the present and the future are intimately connected. Take the women's marches that erupted across the world this past weekend. People descended to, or I'm thinking descended down to DC, but people emerged um, or, or you know, came together in cities across the globe. And it was because they believed that the stories that they had told about who they are that had emerged from the past were slowly being dismantled by our new president. And so they came together to reaffirm those stories of the past in order to set a stage for a more hopeful future, a future in which they believed there would be greater equality for women, for gay men and women, for trans people, and so on. And so we see how this stories of the past that we tell in the present become the landscape on which we seek to build a more hopeful future. Now, I want to touch on a challenge that I think um, the field of social impact design is, is confronting right now. And I think that we've focused so heavily on the individual, which in many ways is a great strength, but perhaps our leading with empathy has led us to focus on the individual at the expense of the social. Um, and to, to sort of build on that, I want to talk about two projects that are currently being funded by the Gates Foundation. The first one is Adolescent 360. And this project is, is reimagining and redefining the way sexual and reproductive health programs are designed and delivered for adolescent girls and young women throughout the world, or in several different countries. But I think we can all agree those are very, very critical goals. It's been proven that when we delay childbirth for a young girl, she stays in school longer. Um, she's more likely to become a wage earner for her family. She's more likely to become a better mother and a better steward for her children's futures. That this actually uh, produces uh, better, more healthy, more productive communities, and that this has a great benefit on society overall. Um, of this, there is absolutely no question. 
And Adolescent 360 is very much built on this foundation, and it draws on the expertise of child development specialists. We also at the foundation asked for it to draw on the expertise of anthropologists, and at first the implementers um, who've, who've done a fantastic job with this, with this project were a little bit uneasy. What, what does that mean? Why do we actually want to draw on anthropologists? And I guess what I would say is, uh, or the reason that it was, it was very critical to me, is that I think that we need to interrogate what happens to the fabric of, uh, or the social fabric, when we take a normative social relation, such as girls having children by the age of 15, um, which is common in, let's say, you know, Tanzania, for example, and we drastically alter that by delaying it several years. And again, the question is not, do we, do we delay? Yes, absolutely we delay. But how do we do a better, under jo a better job of really looking at what does that do, not just on an individual level, but what does that do on a social level when we radically alter these normative social relations? The second project, Panchpar, I think can help explain this, th th why this broader perspective is so critical. So in Panchpar, we're, we're seeking to understand why in a state like Bihar, um, where vaccination rates are incredibly high, women are uh, incent successfully incentivized to, to make their antenatal and postnatal care visits. We have incredibly high rates of birthing in facilities, and yet we still have an astonishingly high rate of children under five who are dying too soon. And it leads us to question why. We pushed all those things forward, believing that it was going to address the child mortality issues. And in fact, it's not. And so one of the things that we've done with this project is we've taken a design anthropology perspective um, to begin to say, OK, let's move beyond those clinical and medical factors that, that help us understand vulnerability and start to think about what are the social factors that, that bring about vulnerability, the cultural factors and the economic factors. Um, and we believe that this is going to help us design new ways of identifying vulnerabilities to poor health outcomes before a child ever gets to a health worker or a health facility, because so many don't actually get there, or they get there and it's too late. Um, and one of the things that's actually come out of this project that, that I think you'll see the link to Adolescent 360 is that one of the factors that's emerging as um, a clear sign of increased vulnerability is how many, how, what kind of access to multiple caretakers a particular child has. So the fewer people at home involved in caring for that child the higher likelihood we're seeing that that child will be vulnerable to poor health outcomes. Now, this project is very much in the early phases, and it's, it's still sort of unraveling. But we can begin to see some connections. We delay women's uh, girls' birth, childbirth. It's increasing the likelihood that they are going to be raising children outside of the extended family or in a much smaller group. But is that perhaps also having an effect on whether or not children are becoming vulnerable to poor health outcomes? So how can we design projects that take that broader view, that begin to place these issues within a much more social and systemic set of views? So we need more projects like Adolescent 360, but we also need more projects that deliberately take that social view. Um, towards imagining solutions that go beyond the individual. Um, and, and, and I'll leave you all with this, but the, the visual on this side demonstrates some of the steps that we're putting in place at the foundation that we think are really critical for designing a social impact design project. Um, so traditionally, development projects have started with a theory of change. At the foundation, we ask people, um, we ask our grantees to tell, for, to one, respond to a, a challenge that has already been completely defined, 
and two, to give us the theory of change that they're going to use to do that, to help us see how their proposed solution is going to uh, lead to the change we would like to affect. This blows my mind. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, and I think what I said earlier is sort of a, a key to that. I think that we need to go into more projects, and what I've been pushing for is going into more projects, recognizing that we don't really know what exactly is the problem that we're seeking to solve. And because we don't know that, we don't exactly know yet what's the change we're seeking to affect. And so I'm trying to, we're trying to establish a situation where we can start more projects from that design research phase. And one, clearly define our problem, but also two, really rigorously analyze the results to that design research phase so that we come out with a framework, what I often call a behavioral model, to not just categorize or catalog behavior, but actually to explain why do certain social and cultural norms produce this type of behavior. From that step, you know, a lot of, in, in a lot of design projects, the jump is, is pretty quickly to design goals or design principles. But what we're asking people to do is take a step back and say, what are the key change indicators we need to see? What are the levers we need to move so that we can really see effective and sustained change. And it's only then that we can articulate what is that theory of change. We then lead to design goals and design principles. And then from there, what I've seen um, in terms of some of the more um, successful projects we've been working on is not one-off solutions, but a set of more like solution domains that are going to begin to respond to the problem from a number of different vantage points that are going to see these problems as embedded in the social. Um, and then that links to the evaluation. The evaluation is dictated by what were those key change indicators and how do we use that to evaluate um, throughout the process. So I've probably gone over time. Um, and I hope, I mean, in the past 15, probably over minutes, I've taken you on a bit of a journey, starting <laughs> with a more esoteric uh, hill tribes and spirit locks and symbols. Um, but I hope you can see how, how we're using this journey in the foundation to try to, to set the stage for a more effective um, social design process, and I thank you for sticking with me, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.